Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Authentication Landscape for Librarians and Media Specialists, brought to you by Library Journal and EBSCO. My name is Rebecca Joswick, and I will be your moderator, but before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over with you. Your screen is completely customizable. You can resize any of the windows and move them around, so feel free to adjust as needed to get the most out of your screen space. If you accidentally close any of your windows, you can bring them back up by clicking the appropriate widget down at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions for our presenter today, and I sure hope you do, go ahead and submit those through that Q&A window anytime. We will save a little bit of room at the end of the webcast to address your questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource list, and you'll be able to download your CE certificate from the certification window once you've met the viewing requirements. And uh, you should see that Twitter window on your screen as well. You can tweet us today at Library Journal with the hashtag LJEBSCO. We also have a short survey for you following the webcast. It should open up in a new tab in your browser, so we'd really appreciate your input. If you don't mind, just take a minute or two after the webcast to answer those questions. And finally, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, click on that Help widget in the bottom of your screen. You can find some system requirements and FAQs. If that doesn't resolve your issue, just send a note through the Q&A, and I will get to you with a solution as quickly as I can. Um, our speaker today, Christina Symes, Technical Solutions Lead at Open Athens. And uh, Christina, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Rebecca. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for all the attendees for giving me an hour of your time. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so as, as Rebecca said, my name is Christina, um, and I'm very lucky to have a job uh, doing something I absolutely love. I help people get access to knowledge. Um, so when I was eight, I actually wanted to be a scientist, and then by the age of 12, I changed my mind, and I was convinced that librarians had the best deal. So they had all the books, and they were allowed to read all day. Um, meanwhile, I had to peel some potatoes in Lithuania. So thankfully, you know, my attempt at becoming a rock star at 16 didn't work out, and I have eventually landed in that prime position to help both scientists and librarians. Uh, so my main interest um, is helping people to get access to knowledge. And that is because I believe that knowledge helps people do amazing things. Um, and my mission is to make this as easy as possible. So I have been blessed to work with organizations uh, such as the one that designed the Gherkins diagrid in London on this beautiful building, um, invented smart home lighting systems, and even discovered asteroids. Um, so it, it, it's been uh, a jolly good ride with Open Athens. Um, and to help librarians help researchers, I've, I wrote a short book a couple of years back that explains all authentication methods in plain English. So if you are interested in the subject, please help yourselves to a free copy from the Springer website. Um, now, before I go ahead, I just want to know how many of you today are librarians um, or identify as a librarian? Um, so just click on the screen if you are a librarian. That's the top answer, yes. If you work in a library but do something else, uh, click the second one. Um, I, I don't know if there are any vendors with us today, but uh, that would be good to know. And if you prefer to remain unknown, uh, just click I am a mystery attendee. Okay, just a couple more seconds. Hope everybody had a chance to click. Shall we see the results? Ooh, okay, so the vast majority are indeed librarians. And um and we have some mystery attendees as well. That's that's exciting. Um so you know that that is amazing. For those of you who, who are librarians, you hold the keys to the knowledge that can change the world. And you know, being grandeur and cheesy and all that, but I think it is very important to know about the tools that can help you succeed with this mission. Um, and today, I want to talk about the various ways you can help your users access online resources. So let's start with a little bit of history. In, in my opinion, two main events changed the way access to online resources is perceived. And more importantly, it changed our capability to connect to researchers and connect researchers to that content. 45 years ago, 
at the uh, 1974 big uh, yellow bubble, um, Vin Cerf and Bob Kahn invented the Internet Protocol, and they're called fathers of the Internet. Um, so although it was meant to be an experiment, it soon gained such popularity that despite the USA's government's best attempts to contain it, the Internet was born. And then computers became cheaper and found their way into every household, thanks to IBM. Um, people realized they needed remote access pretty soon. But why is that? Access to what? So things like work files, other people computers, you know, the exciting stuff, the lockdown university resources. Um, so the remote access issue as such is, is pretty old. Um, and in 1996, one Microsoft engineer came up with a way to create a tunnel connection to his work computer. And so we had the birth of the VPN, or virtual private network. Um, despite significant effort that takes to maintain it, VPN is still a popular way to access resources, um, especially I find in, in big pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and then the same year, in 1996, a group of people in the University of Bath in the UK conceived an idea of this new proprietary remote access protocol called Athens Agent. So they tested it for, for, for a year, they went through a bunch of paperwork, and eventually registered Athens as a brand name in, in 1997. Um, and at one point in time, Athens was free for all higher education institutions in the United Kingdom, while the rest of the world was taken care of by Easy Proxy, created by Chris Zagar in 1999. Um, and I think we will all agree he was a hero systems librarian who made the best out of the limited technology available at the time, um, and his product was a real success. So let's have a look at the IP-based access in more detail. Um, what, what is it? How does it work? So just a quick recap. We, I, I know everybody knows how it works, um, but in my head, it's, it's a busy street full of cars. And at the end of that street, there is a big gate, um, and only red cars are allowed to go in. And this is how I see publishers filtering out traffic, uh, by allowing known IP addresses access protected content. Except with cars in real in the real world, you would probably have a more secure access because of number plates tied to the make and the model and potentially the driver. With IP access, it's as good as filtering vehicles by color. So say I decided to spray my car red, and then there would be no stopping me. Um, so not getting into hacking. Um, but yeah, that, that that's how that works. Um, so I'm sure everybody will have used VPN at, at some point in your lives, perhaps to access your work computers from home. And this is one of the main IP-based access methods used in libraries today, uh, one of the three, actually. And the second one is a proxy. Um, so my favorite question, what does a proxy do? Please stick the top one if you think it changes users' IP address. Second, if you think it conducts man-in-the-middle attack. And uh, third answer, if you think it does both. Okie dokie. Let's see. It's, oh, you know what? I'll vote as well. Here we go. Um, all right, so we have we have a split in the audience. Um, all of you are right, um, it, but it, in, in the very fact, it does both. Okay, so it, it does um, both changing the user IP address and man in the middle attack, and this is what it looks like. Um, so say I'm Ted and I want to access Science Direct, um, but I'm not on my university um, campus, I'm actually accessing this from home. So I'm going, uh, I'm going to go to my library portal, um, click on the proxy link, and then the proxy server on my behalf will make that request to Science Direct and go to Science Direct and say, hi, I'm Ted, but this is my IP address, the IP address that belongs to the university. And Science Direct will see, OK, the car is red, the IP address matches. Um, Ted is authorized and will send back the content to the proxy server, and the proxy server will send the content back to Ted. Um, so in that way, it's, it, it is indeed mad in the middle, um, in, in the truer sense of it. It sees all of your traffic, and you know sometimes people think, oh, it's, it's great, you know, I remain anonymous while I access that vendor. Um, 
but it, in the very fact you're not anonymous. Um, the proxy server knows who you are, and the proxy server um, knows exactly what you clicked on, all the articles that you access. So really, there's very little privacy there. Uh, but that's in effect that's how it works. And these are the vendors that we know of today, uh, the most popular vendors at least, uh, who deal with uh, proxy access. Uh, so Liblinks, which is sort of advanced, shibboleth proxy, um, innovative solutions, some of you may have dealt with these. Remote access, uh, not many people have heard of this one, but that's an Indian-based um, proxy provider. Easy proxy, of course, um, the, the father of proxies. And then Open Athens has an inbuilt proxy module just to sort of help out um, access those resources that can only ever do IP recognition. Um, so why proxy is good and IP-based access is good in general? If it was bad, we wouldn't be using it. Um, so the benefits that it provides is, um, for example, when you are on site, no login is necessary and you can just go in and access whatever your institution um, has bought for you. It is a well-known authorization method. It's not really authentication because you can't um, identify a person by an IP address. Um, but as, as far as authorization goes, it is so well established. It's 45 years in the running. Everybody knows. You know, if if you go to a publisher and say, "I want to access this journal. Uh, this is my IP address," 99% of the time they will know exactly where to put it. They will know exactly where to do it. Um, and it, it's easy to enable access using IP address, and no ID identity verification is required at all. So you don't really have to prove who you are, that you are a valid user. You don't have to pass any personal information. You just click on the link, and it does its thing. Um, but of course, you know there are some drawbacks as well, um, and that's what I really love to talk about. <laughs> Uh, the drawbacks of IP-based access. Um, I do a lot of user research, and this particular example on the slide comes from a conversation I had with a second-year aerospace engineer student at the University of the West of England. So he was telling me about his latest assignment on Wing's aspect ratio. And I've asked him to demonstrate how would he go about researching the subject. So he went onto Google Scholar and typed in Wing's aspect ratio. Um, many, many people Google um, stuff, and that's where they start their research journeys. Um, and the first article um, led him to the Aerospace Research Central, which is this resource. Um, but of course, there was no way for him to log in because his university was using a proxy, so he got a little bit lost there. And this sort of experience, it encourages piracy because, you know, what, what will the student do next? Um, and that that question is answered by one of the lecturers that I've spoke to recently. Uh, that's um, uh, one of my friends at the University of Health Sciences. And I asked him whether he thinks that his students use pirated content, it, just out of interest. So this is what he said. Um, he said, I start my research on PubMed. Um, and once I find the article I need, I, I have two choices. So first, I can be a good citizen, go to the library portal, um, log in then find the publisher in the A to Z list, then go to the site via proxy and search for the DOI link again in there. Or I can just paste the DOI link into Sci-Hub. So which one do you think I'm going to do? Um, and that is a lecturer saying that. So what do you think his students do? Of, of course, you know, it's uh, not endorsed um, officially, but if the time economy is so obvious, it, it, it sort of forces people to choose the, to, to do shortcuts instead of uh, choosing the legitimate way to access content. Now, this is not the only problem. So poor user experience is something most of us are aware of, um, but it's far from being the only problem. So a couple of years back, two guys have conducted extensive research on IP ranges held by publishers and found that 58% of them were inaccurate. So this is a true story. One university in Germany subscribed to Wiley Online Library. And that university was then assigned a different IP range. And their old IP addresses were given to another institution. So for a year, the university paid a substantial subscription price due to increased usage, which was, of course, due to another institution getting a free ride completely by accident. 
So the IP registry, um, it, it's a really good tool. It aims to address this problem by providing a single place for libraries and publishers to keep their on-site IP addresses up to date. That means that who, whichever publisher is part of the IP registry, they can just fetch the information from there and libraries only have to update it once. For that to work, of course, both parties need to participate. So there will still be publishers that you need to update um, manually. But it, it it is a good tool. Um, before I carry on talking about uh, IP, um, has anybody has anybody heard of IPv6 or perhaps dealt with IPv6? It's it's IP version six. Um, let's see. Ooh. Clever, clever audience. Um, very nice. Okay. So I should have probably included a question how you feel about it. Um, with with IPv4, th this is the IP address as we know it. That That's what they look like. Everybody knows what that is. But as of 2011, they're all gone. Um, and I know there are two free IP ranges knocking about somewhere in Africa, um, still not taken. But as of 2011, by and large, we are now dealing with these sort of IP addresses, um, IP version 6, and it is a, a big hexadecimal beast that can be shortened, lengthened, and um, nobody really wants to deal with it. So I personally don't know of a single publisher who supports this particular format for IP access. Um, if you do, please put it in the Q&A. I, I would love to know. Um, and up until today, uh, and, until you guys said yes, uh, I didn't know of a single librarian who would be aware of this or be happy to manage this. Um, so although it does have a short hat format, it, it does not really make it any easier to read. So if you're using cloud services such as Microsoft, Azure, Google, or Amazon, quite likely you're already using these sort of IP addresses, just not necessarily touching them all on a daily basis. So I'd see that, you know, it, it is a big change. It, I see that as a little bit of a problem um, because the publishing industry will have to, again, adapt. Um, so it's not just different access methods that, that are now bothering people, but the different formats of access credentials. Um, and here's what the father of the internet himself said about IPv6, um, or running out of IPv4 addresses more precisely. Um, he said, I thought it was an experiment, and I thought that 4.3 billion would be enough to do an experiment, which it would be. Um, he says, who the hell knew how much address space we needed? Um, so clearly, you know, there's a little bit of frustration there that I'm sure will be passed on to the uh, library industry eventually. Now, talking about IP-based access methods, I, I can't do that without mentioning Google CASA. This is new. This has just come out in 2016. Um, so can I have a very quick virtual raise of hands? Um, is your library part of the Google Subscriber Links program? Because if you are, chances are that you are using Google CASA to some extent. Okay, I'm just going to count to 10 to allow for any buffer. So I'm in the United Kingdom today. I know there are attendees joining from all over the world. Uh, let's see. Okay. Right, so 12% said yes. So for those who said yes, um, this, is, this is how it works. Um, so Google Casa, what, what does it do for publishers? Well, first of all, it allows them to index their content on Google, which is a very good thing for, for a publisher. It increases their visibility. And for libraries, when it first came out, it, it seemed like this amazing compromise, the solution that combines traditional on-site IP access with, with remote access. And um, in essence, to use it, you have to log into Google account when you are on site, um, then access Google Scholar, um, and adjust the settings to associate with your institution. And after that, you can go home and access content for 30 days. So I thought, well, I'll try it. And 
what I'm about to show you is somewhat naughty, what I've done, but I've done it exclusively for the academic purposes. So just before you report me, similar things have been done before and written about by computer scientists. Um, so I thought that this might be a security risk, effectively, how it works. Um, so I drove to a nearby university. I logged into the Wi-Fi network. And that is all without hacking, because the first person I asked, they just gave me the password. Um, and then I logged into my Google account and accessed Google Scholar. So sure enough, after returning home, I had access to all publisher websites that participate in CASA. Um, these screenshots that you see here, they, they were taken 30 days later, actually. Um, I don't know how long it takes for the token to expire. It's supposed to take 30 days, but I think it might be taking a little longer these days. So if the publisher like JSTOR participates in, in Google has a program, that is all it takes to get this content. Um, and I know that some librarians, they put high value on security and privacy. And there's really none of that here, because one, Google knows everything. And there are so many talks about piracy and how this evil Albakian is stealing researchers' credentials. But she no longer has to do any of that uh, because she can just, you know, go onto any institution's campsite or send one of her minions, um, log into a made-up Google account, and download to a heart's content. There is no validation. So one of the questions, you know, you might need to answer to yourself is does this access method have the potential to drive your subscription price up. Um, and yeah, that, I'll just leave that with you. Um, so let's have a look at uh, the advanced access methods period, which started in, in 2002 with emergence of, of SAML. Uh, SAML is security assertion markup language. And right after it was released to the wild, the Internet2 project put foundations for Shibboleth, which is an open source SAML software that you may have heard of. Then in 2008, uh, Athens changed the name to Open Athens to reflect the adoption of open standards. And we ditched the proprietary Athens agent, which is a shame, really, because I love the name. Um, in 2014, Ping, Microsoft, and Google came together, and then they created OpenID Connect Protocol, um, which is the next generation federated access. And I would say it's tailored for the mobile era. It's, it's very lightweight. And then finally, in 2016, um, Google came out with CASA, or Campus Activated Subscriber Access, uh, which we have just looked at. So let's talk about the, the, the more advanced era. And to start with, let me quote this amazing person to just illustrate the change of mindset since 2002. Johan Tilstra, um, he used to be a systems librarian in, in the Netherlands. And he did a ton of user interviews in his institution. And then subsequently came up with a wonderful product, a, a browser extension that facilitates seamless user experience, regardless of whether you're using EasyProxy or OpenAthens. And he says that forcing users to access content through the library portal is no longer sensible, especially in the mobile era. Libraries will have to step up to provide a better user experience. Otherwise, patrons will simply walk away. Um, so SAML is just one of the tools that uh, you, can, you can use um, to help provide that better user experience and access from anywhere. Uh, let's have a very quick look at how it works. Um, I'm not going to go technical, but in essence, uh, what we see in the picture here happens in, in split second when you're using SAML. So say Rob, um, my colleague Rob, wants to access Science Direct, and he goes um, there and is prompted with a paywall. Um, what he does next is clicks on institutional login, and Science Direct sends an automatic request to his institution. So Science Direct knows by the choice, uh, by, by Rob clicking hospital, for example, uh, he, he, Science Direct knows where to send him. Um, and uh, Science Direct asks hospital, do you know this guy? Um, you know, does he have a valid session with you, effectively? Um, and the hospital says, well, not really, but it doesn't reply to Science Direct. It goes straight to Rob and says, Rob, can you please prove your identity? Can you log in? Rob puts in his username and password. Uh, the session is created for the hospital. Hospital sends a nice little token to Science Direct, and then Rob can access Science Direct. Um, and in Open Athens case, you can access any 
resources in the institution subscribes to for eight hours after that. So that session just sort of goes for everything. And SAMU is the foundation of uh, what we call federated access. Um, federated access is, in essence, it's like a group of friends who know and trust each other. Many of you might be familiar with federated access in the sense of logging into Office 365 or another application, um, and that meaning that you don't have to log into anything else on your network. Um, the federated access I have in mind is precisely the same. It only works on a global scale. So there are currently about 64 federations in the world, and most of them are geared towards providing federated access to academics from a particular country. Um, Open Athens happens to be the only global federation that is not limited to academic institutions. Um, but there is this observed movement um, for, for every country to, to participate in federated access um, because it just facilitates um, the conversation in, in between research and so much so much better. So who deals with federated access? Um, these are the main vendors today. I appreciate that is not too much choice. So Shibboleth is open source uh, software. Um, founded back in 2002 when SAML first came out. And it's something that if you want to spin it up, you have to maintain it yourself on, on your network. And then OpenAssense is a hosted counterpart. It's a proprietary te technology, but it uses the same SAML standards. Um, we have a proxy module to sort of help people with accessing resources via IP if that is absolutely necessary. And then there are two providers that uh, give you what's, what's called shibbolized proxy. So you can log into a proxy service uh, more securely than you normally would, um, perhaps with your own directory credentials. So that's easy proxy and liblinks. Um, the benefits of, of federated access in, in SAML in general is that it is designed for the single sign-on on the web. So it's designed to improve that user experience, and it is super secure. It has never been hacked. Um, it provides personalization on publisher websites, so where you can access your own uh, folders, your own bookmarks, in addition to anonymity. I, I think that's what really makes it so attractive, uh, that you can absolutely remain anonymous by a clever manipulation of attributes. Um, nobody has to know who, who you are exactly. They just they will just know that you are a different user from the one before. Um, and it can help reduce subscription price. So um, with SAML, you can have rather granular reporting, um, regardless of whether you're using Shibboleth or OpenAthens, it's just a different way to, to, to run that report, I suppose. Um, but if you can prove to the publisher how much you're using the resource, how many users are accessing each month, um, that can really help with that negotiation. And we've seen that happen in the past. Um, just like IP access, it does also have it, its drawbacks. So inconsistent user experience is one niggle that librarians tend to have against federated vendors. What that means is that every vendor can put their login button in a different place um, and in a different manner. So some might say um, login to the institutional login. Some might say choose between open assets and shibboleth, which Personally, I, I don't think it's fair. It's sort of the same as asking about your motherboard model when you just want to buy a USB stick. So federated access, in general, it begs for dialogue with digital vendors, which is exactly what movements like RE21 um, are aiming to do. Um, before I talk about RE21, how many of you are familiar with this movement? See, okay, 50-50 split. Um, so RE21, in, in essence, I'm just going to read the quote. And I know there are attendees um, among us today who are actually working for RE21, and they will be much greater experts than I am. Um, RE21 is seeking to improve that user experience by having that dialogue with libraries and publishers. Um, under understanding that authorizing access based on just IP recognition no longer works 
in today's distributed world, people are accessing resources remotely more and more, and there are mobile devices everywhere. Um, and of, of course, you know, everybody's heard of blockchain, how, you know, identity is going to be distributed um, perhaps 10 years later. Um, so really, RE21 is, is looking to um, improve all of this. Um, and um, it, yeah, well, that, that's what they're all about. I would I'll probably ask one of the attendees to, to talk about it more. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't. Um, sorry, I got, got distracted. Um, so um, just let, let me leave you with this comparison table. Um, this is something I've put together after speaking to tons and tons of librarians. I've, you know, I've asked what is important to you um, when you're buying, uh, when you're looking to buy an identity and access management system, when you're looking to manage resources. Um, and these are the, the things that they mentioned. So implementation efforts is obviously very important because so many libraries are now going um, for all sorts of migrations, such as Alma, Ex Libris product migrations, and that takes a lot of time. Um, so the last thing they want to do is, you know, spend another month or two implementing, say, Shibboleth. Um, anonymity, privacy, that is always, that's always been very important because of legislation such as GDPR that have recently come out in, in Europe. Um, I know that uh, USA also have um, quite a few legislations and, and Canada as well. And th this, you know, privacy of the patrons is, is very, very important. Um, personalization is another important thing, which does not necessarily, in, in the proxy world, it does not lend itself um, to coincide with anonymity and, and privacy. And personalization on vendors' websites is very important to researchers that want to save um, their uh, articles for references and things like that. Um, security has always been important, and the effort for the end user, the lower the better. Um, so at this point in time, although none of the solutions displayed in this table are perfect, as someone who questions everything and loves reading protocol specifications in spare time, I know that Open Athens is the best tool to help your users access the knowledge they need so they can do great things at this point in time. Thank you very much, and we'll open for questions. Thanks, Christina. Um, let me go ahead and push to this lovely question mark slide. Do have quite a few questions from the audience and uh, attendees out there. Uh, please go ahead and, if you do have any additional questions or a question you haven't asked yet, go ahead and throw that into the Q&A window. We've got plenty of time to get to your questions today. Um, all right, Christina. I'll ask you this first one from Pam at Kettering College Library. You mentioned um, SAML. Can you just maybe explain what that is a little bit more for people who are not familiar with that? Of course. So SAML is just another access method. Um, it works in a different way from, from IP. Um, it is based on uh, central identity, if, if you will. I'm just trying not to use any technical terms here. Um, so effectively, your institution is in charge of your identity in the SAML world. Um, if you are part of an institution as a student, for example, um, that institution can vouch for you when you go to access resources on publishers' websites. Um, so all it takes is a click on institutional login, and then your uh, your university, perhaps you know if you're a student, it can verify who you are, um, and all you have to do as a student is just put in your username and password as as usual. Um, and again, not every single time. So SAMU is designed for that single sign-on experience. Once you log into your institution, that's it. You go forward um, accessing the resources that you want to access um, without any friction. So there is no need to put in your username and password over and over again. Uh, use very special links. There's always a way to get to the resource that you want to get to, um, either by discovering yourself on the publisher's platform or clicking on authenticated link 
or um, using perhaps a link resolver such as um, such as EBSCO Discovery Service. Um, so, so there's always a way to get in there. Um, that's effectively what what SAML is. Um, you know, it's called security assertion markup language. But we don't need to understand that. Uh, it, it's just the name of of, of the protocol, um, as the name implies. It's, it's very secure, a lot more secure than proxy access. Um, was there anything in particular that you wanted to know about SAML? Because I can talk about SAML for days. Um, so if, if, if there was anything in particular, I could probably um, head in that direction. Uh, well, great. Thank you for that. And uh, if anybody does want to know a little bit more about SAML, just stick a note through the Q&A. And it sounds like Christine is happy to dive a little deeper. Um, but until we hear back, um, let me ask this other question from Athena. Um, for personalization, institutions need to supply user attributes. Um, so what, this is a multifaceted question, so if I need to repeat any part, just let me know. What attributes are typically released? Is there a recommended practice? And can users control the released attributes? Um. Right, so um, let's start with the first one. What is normally released? What is normally released, it depends on your institutions, who is in control of your identity, on its policy. Um, what is released with Open Athens is something that I can tell you about right now. So as a standard, we will release something that is called EduPerson Scopes Affiliation, um, which would be member at institution XYZ. It is completely anonymous. It just testifies that you are a member of that institution. If you want to release something else, such as staff at institution XYZ or student at institution XYZ, you can do that too. Um, but it is rather non-standard for publishers to look for that information. Um, most publishers, they rely on member at institution XYZ to uh, verify that you know you are indeed coming from a subscribing instance. Um, what else is released? We always release targeted ID as a standard. And a targeted ID is a completely anonymous string of characters. Um, so, so what that is, it's a calculation. Um, it consists on your um, identifier, publisher's identifier, the username, and sometimes the salt value. Now, we don't need to be concerned about that. It's just 22 letters that mean absolutely nothing to anyone else but that user and that publisher. So that's how the publisher knows that this user is different from the one before. And they can use that string of characters to um, release personalization functionality. So for example, when you log into Science Direct, um, you will see your bookmarks and your folders and any saved searches, if you like, that are tied to that targeted ID. RefWorks is another good one. ProQuest, I believe, also provides something like that. EBSCO, I know EBSCO used that for sure. So you can tie your personal profile and your folders um, with your targeted ID. And that is done uh, completely at the will of the end user. So if they want to provide their name, they can do that after they have tied their institutional login um, to, to, to that targeted ID. Um, now, the recommended practice, it depends on where you are. Um, in Europe, under GDPR, the recommended practice is the less the better. So um, no release of attributes without prior user consent, um, or at least the user should have a way to, to control it. And as you mentioned, your next question was, can users control this um, release of attributes? Um, so as far as user control goes, in Shibboleth 3.0, you can, if you want to, implement a user consent screen um, that says, we will release this information to this publisher. Do you agree? Now, mm -hmm. it can be a little bit annoying um, from time to time because you're prompted with that screen every single time you go to a new publisher website. Um, and recognizing that Open Athens is now developing a very similar functionality that will be perhaps slightly less annoying and we'll, we will only prompt this with a screen when it's really necessary, when some personally identifiable information will be released. Okay, great. Thank you for answering that um, multifaceted question. And I 
did see a question come through from an attendee asking if this will be recorded and a link sent out. Yes, um, you will receive an email in about 24 hours. So feel free to catch anything you missed. And let me ask you this one, Christina from Otto. Is Open Athens primarily for academic libraries, or could public libraries use this effectively as well? Absolutely. So anybody can use Open Athens. Um, and, you know, I, I would very much love everybody to use Open Athens. Um, we do integrate with all the directories. Um, we have public libraries, um, such as, you know, big uh, Swan Consortium in, uh, um, actually, I forget the state. Um, uh, but yes, um, we, we do have a lot of customers that are public libraries and, and using Open Athens. So we'll integrate with Circe Dynex. Let's go have developed this nifty integration with Koha which is now as a sort of a community property. Um, and you, you can access it on GitHub if you like, so it's really easy to, to work with it. Um, any other ILS systems, any um, directories, in, in essence, uh, there is the whole range of connectors. Um, and Open Athens, as a federation, it is not restricted to academia at all. Um, so any commercial organization can join. And that historically has been the problem for, say, big pharmaceutical companies that were simply not allowed to join um, academic organizations, academic federations within their, own, uh, within their own country, but were still needing to access research resources online. Um, and that's where Open Athens sort of comes in to meet that need. Okay, great. And uh, I have another question about Open Athens from John at Coastal Carolina University. How does Open Athens align with the RA21 initiative? By utilizing Shibboleth running on top of SAML, is Open Athens necessary, or is it more of a value-added service? Yes, it, it is more of a value-added service, um, John. So um, Open Athens has functionality that Shibboleth does not necessarily have such as very nice UI, reporting, um, easy configuration of permission sets. So say if you want to um, allow only a certain group of users to access resources and not the other, uh, that's what you can do very easily with Open Athens and configure automatic rules. It would take a lot more effort if you were running Shibboleth, um, not to mention that Open Athens is a hosted service. Um, and that sort of removes the need to, to, to run, um, to, to have Shibboleth overheads um, at, when maintaining it, because Shibboleth, it needs to be run on a local server 99% um, of the time. Um, so yeah, uh, it is an, a value-add service. As far as RE21 goes, um, we are part of the RE21 steering committee, um, and we are very much um, advocating for RE21. Um, we have recently developed um, this feature called the Wayfinder that helps publishers um, with discovery of organizations. So what it does, effectively, it is a search box, just like a Google search box. And um, when the user starts typing their institutional name, it's a type ahead, and it searches all the federations that that publisher is currently in. Um, so the user can find themselves regardless which federation they're coming from. And that eases the friction that they normally go through when selecting their institution, then trying to select their federation. You know, federation names, they don't really mean much to end users. They don't know what uh, UK AMF is, or what in common is, or what Ganukin is. Um, all, all of those names, they're just acronyms for those federations in those countries. Um, so yes, that we sort of we're trying to contribute and and we're trying to participate as much as possible in RE21. I'm be curious to know how many um, attendees on the line are also um, so enthusiastic about that initiative. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I have another question. I know you kind of touched on managing access. Um, can we manage access to different groups of users? with Open Athens, and how does that work? Yes, absolutely. So that is one of the main things that Open Athens does. Um, I guess when, when comparing that with Shibboleth, in Shibboleth you would have to 
modify an XML file um, or you know a code file <laughs> in, in, in human. You you would just have to type in a few lines of code there um, to make sure that user certain groups of users have access to certain groups of resources. Um, in Open Athens, it's a click of a button. Um, so for example, um, my institution has a DFS. And we have decided that we're going to plug that ADFS into Open Athens. And anybody coming through with a certain email address will have access to one group of resources. And anyone coming in with a different email address will have access to a different group of resources. Or perhaps, you know, someone from chemistry department will only have access to um, certain resources um, assigned to that team. And that way, we can manage our subscription costs. And then all other departments will have access to a generic pool of resources. So that is something that Open Athens is very much designed to do, um, manage yeah. access to resources in, in that way. Um, it can be done on absolutely any uh, string of characters or an attribute that you pass to us from your local directory, as long as there is some sort of pattern there. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, I have another one from Ken, who's asking, so what's in it for publishers? Well, there's a lot in the Open Athens for publishers. Um, this session was geared definitely towards uh, the library users more. Um, but we do have a lot of material, and we do run regular webinars for publishers um, in particular. We have a wonderful product called Keystone. So what it does effectively, it takes out the pain of doing anything with SAML because, um, you know, Implementing SAML on the publisher side is usually quite expensive and it takes time. Um, but with Keystone, um, publishers don't have to do any of that. Um, they can just use a very lightweight OpenID Connect. And OpenID Connect is available in pretty much any language at all. You just download the plugin. Um, you add that to your application, and then it works in the same way that Google Social Login or Facebook Social Login would. So it, it will pass you, you know, um, JSON claims into your application that you can then process and manage access that way. So you don't really have to deal with SAML. Open Athens does the SAML part. Um, and we've seen cases where publishers have implemented Open Athens um, access in, in just four days or under a week. It is normally quite lightweight. We have a dedicated team that does that. Um, and then with that, you can go and be a member of any federation in the world, if you like, and access a, a massive pool of, um, of, of your customers. Hmm. OK, great. So yeah, a lot in it for publishers. <laughs> And um, speaking of SAML, I have another SAML question from Stephen at Indiana State University. Is SAML the most common way um, libraries allow us users to request articles from ScienceDirect? That is a very good point. You know, um, Elsevier um, is, is the parent organization for ScienceDirect, and they are on RE21 steering committee. So they are very much interested in um, in going federated and, and doing SAML more and more. Without talking to that particular provider, I wouldn't know if that is the most common way um, that they are being requested to enable access. Um, but I know that they are going in that direction. And there are many publishers that are going in that direction, primarily because they can manage um, access in, in a better way. It is a lot more secure. So there's less risk that somebody will obtain that institution's credentials and hack into the resource and download a bunch of resources, um, unlike with proxy, where it is rather easy to do IP spoofing and access articles illegally and then you know get them onto other, uh, other platforms. Um, so it, it is a very difficult question to, to answer without, without actually talking to Science Direct. Um, I think, but but definitely good to ask. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, we still have a lot of really great questions coming in. Uh, Rosie from RRU says, uh, you mentioned that deep linking is problematic with Open Athens. Could you please speak to that a little bit more? Ah, okay, that is one of my misleading slides. Let me just go back to it real quick. Uh, 
I'll try to find it from from the deck. Just a second, drawbacks, drawbacks. There we go. Um, hopefully, everyone can see the slide. Um, so deep linking. Not every publisher realizes the value of deep linking. Um, it is absolutely not a problem with OpenAssense because if the publisher cannot deep link in a federated way and say you absolutely need to point to a particular article on a particular platform that has not yet realized the benefit of that, then OpenAssense can find a way to do that even by a proxy if, if that's absolutely uh, necessary. The majority of federated publishers we deal with, however, they, they do realize that because, you know, link resolvers have been around for quite a while and um, all the API calls that need to happen and all the metadata that you want to load into your um, EBSCO EDS, into Alma, into wh wherever that might be. Um, you normally want to do that at article level or at least librarians I speak to, they normally want to provide access to, to an article level or a database level. Um, and then faculty that manage reading lists for their students, they also want to do the same thing. Um, so it, it is quite widespread that deep linking is key. And when we work with, with publishers, when they are implementing Keystone, uh, we assist them in implementing that as well. So it, it is really, you know, a key point of service, but uh, not every single publisher has um, recognized that value yet. So mm -hmm. that is where a drawback is, that not every single one supports it. Oh, good. Thank you for that clarification. <clears throat> and let's see, I have another question. Um, going back to the Google CASA that you mentioned earlier, um, Another question it raises, how do publishers and subscribers deal with suspicious activity originating from a CASA authorized user? What a good question. You know what? I've been wondering the exact same thing. <laughs> I have no idea because only Google is aware who's accessing what and with what account. I don't think that institutions themselves are aware which Gmail accounts are associated with their Google links. So that is an amazing question to ask, but I was not able to find any information uh, online. Google certainly does not provide it. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll go and speak to them, see what <laughs> that's a That's a good idea. I'm sure you could convince them, Christina. Um, and I have another one from Sarah. Um, we're not set up to do a live demo today, but um, Christina, is there any way f or any place folks can go to maybe um, check out a demo of Open Athens? Yep, uh, that would be on the Open Athens website. Um, so if you just Google Open Athens, that will probably be the first link that you find. And um, at the bottom, uh, there should be order a demo or, um, yeah, um, or you can contact uh, EBSCO who are present here today. Um, I'm not sure if there was any generic email for demo purposes that we could give out. Um, and I'm, I'm probably speaking to my EBSCO colleagues here. Um, if we get something through the chat, we can definitely um, yeah. surface yeah. that before we leave for the day. And, and I, I know when we mentioned RA21, I, I said it would be interesting to know how many people were also enthusiastic, and we did get a comment saying RA21 rocks. So at least another person out there who was enthusiastic and excited about that as well. And um, it does look like uh, we did get a note through the team chat. If you would like a demo, you can email OA requests at ebsco.com. That's OA requests at ebsco. Dot com. So if you'd like to see a demo, Sarah, go ahead and reach out to the team and they'll make sure to get you set up. And I do believe we've gotten through all of our our questions today. If somehow, um, oh, here's another one that just came through. Um, Maria is asking, what is IDAP? I'm saying that correctly. Uh, would that be LDAP? LDAP. LDAP is Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. 
normally used with Active Directory that does not have any federated service on top. And by that, I would mean something like Azure or ADFS. Um, so LDAP is uh, the only way Shibboleth integrates with directories. It's, it's, it's a rather old protocol to, to interact uh, with your user data. Um, but yeah, um, it, it, it's still de definitely out there and OpenAthens integrates with that as well. So if you want to know more about that, um, give me a shout or um, give EBSCO a shout and uh, we can have that conversation. But it's, it's not overly interesting. It's just another way of, of accessing um, stuff. But it is not used for federated access. It's not really used for library to publish a conversation. It's more of an internal uh, kind of protocol. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I did see another couple of questions pop up. We do have a few more minutes. Um, going back to one of the polls you had earlier in the presentation about proxy, this attendee is asking, what is a man-in-the-middle attack? Can you uh, explain that just a little bit more? Absolutely. So let me just go back to the slide. There we go. Man-in-the-middle attack is where somebody or something interrupts your uh, traffic um, and sort of manages it in the middle. Sometimes, not in a very good way, but proxy server has been designed to do that in the way that everybody is happy with it. Um, so it is still a, a server sitting in the middle fetching all your requests and modifying them and then forwarding them on to some other party or in this case a vendor and then processing them back um, on, on your behalf and, and giving them back to you. So in this case, we see a diagram where perhaps somebody like Science Direct is serving back the content. It's sending back the page to Ted, um, but in, instead of doing it, Ted doing that, proxy server says, oh, by the way, I'm going to display a different IP address on behalf of Ted. So that's man in the middle attack. In a malicious way, uh, somebody could, you know, steal your traffic when you're trying to legitimately access a vendor, latch on to that and, you know, access it together with you or redirect you to a different website. There, there are many, many ways you can um, do this sort of attack, um, but that's sort of the principle. Okay, thanks for that explanation. And I have another one uh, from Bart at Northwestern University. How can libraries provide walk-in access to non-affiliated users when using Open Athens? Yeah, we do have a special account for that. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that not every single publisher will like uh, accepting this sort of account. Um, it, it, it has a special sort of signature. If, if more than one person accesses, then quite likely the publisher will notice because the targeted ID will be exactly the same or that, you know, that special identifier between the publisher and the user will be exactly the same. Um, but Open Access does support access accounts and what that is is something that the library can dish out when um, few users walk in. Uh, it's a username and password. It's affiliated with that institution so it will still pass member at in institution XYZ but it does have a special um, kind of restriction. So it has the IP perimeter restriction. Those accounts can only be used within that library space. Um, so if the, the walk-in user effectively cannot take those credentials, walk off the site and carry on accessing content. Um, so yeah, we, we, we try to secure it as much as possible. Okay, excellent, thank you. And I, I do believe that will be our last question for the day. What a ton of great questions. Thank you so much, audience. And thank you, Christina, for um, so thoroughly answering our audience's curiosity. And uh, with that, I'll just go ahead and wrap up. Um, don't forget to take that survey. It should open up in a new tab in your browser. It should just take you less than a minute or so to answer those few questions. Um, thanks to EBSCO for sharing Christina with us today. This webcast, as I mentioned, will be archived, and you'll get an email in about 24 hours with a link. You can, of course, find this webcast and other archived and upcoming webcasts in the events and PD section at libraryjournal.com. Thanks so much for spending the time with us today.